remember when I called out to uh, to get some help and, and things like that, the my biggest concern was whether or not the doctors would believe me and that I needed help, but I didn't really know what that help was. So for a comprehensive assessment of a person with an eating disorder, uh, the first thing I like to do is actually just a very brief medical check. Uh, and also you need to be a doctor or nurse to do this. I think it helps for other health professionals to know what we do. And for me, it's just a five minute check. And the reason I like to do that first, because if the person needs admission to hospital, that's often a very um, uh, challenging and difficult emotionally for the person. So I wanna have plenty of time to help work through that with them. So the first thing I do is ask them about, in the last month or two, have they had any problems with their physical or medical health? Uh, just a general question. And it helps the patient to focus then on, on their physical health rather than their weight and their size. And uh, I'd specifically ask about things that can um, lead to sudden death, because we know, for example, anorexia nervosa has a 10 to 20% mortality rate. So I asked about cardiac symptoms. So I'd ask, have you had any problems with fainting, with lightheadedness? with chest pain, with shortness of breath, with palpitations or swelling in your ankles. They're all signs the heart's not working properly. Once I've asked them about that, I ask if they have, uh, when they had their last period and I want to know if they're on any hormones. So I want to know when they had their last natural period because if they've, um, often people say, look, I'm naturally thin, I don't think I'm underweight, but if they haven't had a period for a year, that's a sign that their ovaries have shut down. I also then look at their blood test, which we usually ask the GP to um, do before we see them. And what I'm looking at is in the full blood count, whether they've got neutropenia, which is a low white cell count. So a sign that their bone marrow is suppressed due to starvation, that's very common. And on their biochemistry, are looking for raised liver function tests, low glucose, uh, low potassium, especially if someone's purging, uh, low magnesium or low phosphate. These are all things that are actually a medical uh, emergency and the person could die within hours or days, so they would all indicate they'd need to go to hospital. Then I do a simple test, which is I check their heart rate lying down and their blood pressure, and the heart rate standing up and blood pressure standing up. And I say to the patient, we're just gonna see if your heart's getting enough energy for it to um, behave normally when you stand up. And so for someone who's not getting enough nutrition, if their heart rate jumps up by more than 20 beats per minute, or their blood pressure drops by 20 millimeters, that's an indicator, according to the College of Psychiatrist guidelines and most statewide guidelines for admission to hospital. And then we check their weight and their height so we know what their BMI is. But for me, the weight is the least important thing. Often the eating is very focused on that. I'm really focused on looking at their heart, their bone marrow, their liver, their glucose metabolism, their brain if it's starved, uh, looking at for signs of osteoporosis. So we might get a bone mineral density scan if they haven't had a period for six months. So that's the medical assessment, five minutes and hopefully they've passed that. And then I usually bring them to another room which is a bit more comfortable for talking in so we get out of the medical setting. And the first question I ask them is, what were you hoping to get out of coming along today? And the reason I ask that is because I want to see what's motivating them to seek help. Because always a big part of them is saying, I don't need help, I want to be left alone, I just want to lose more weight. But another part is saying, this is getting, this is really a problem. I had a GP who I like, I liked very much. She was a GP who gave me the time that I needed and um, really listened, tried to understand, tried to connect me with people. Um, I was very, uh, I was very in my eating disorder at the time. So all her attempts I ignored. Um, and I went to see her every week and sat there every week saying, really bad and I can't do anything about it. Then I asked them, um, one of the next things I would ask them is about just their daily eating pattern because, um, and so there's a test I use, which um, dietitians are very familiar with this, but doctors and nurses often aren't, which is B-M-T-L-A-T-D-S. And that acronym stands for breakfast, morning tea, lunch, afternoon, tea, dinner, and supper. And I just wanted to know, um, maybe just yesterday, what did they have for those things? And so a person who's healthy and normal will be having a fairly, you don't need to be a, um, an expert to know what's sort of fairly normal and healthy, but a typical patient might say, look, I don't do breakfast, I just can't. I don't do morning tea. For lunch, I have a salad with rocket and lettuce and tomato and carrot. 
and I always ask, is there any protein or carbohydrate in that? And there's not. Dinner, my husband comes home, so I'll have whatever he's having, but then I throw it up. So that I can see is already I just know a lot about uh, the fact their brain's starved, what their fears are, when they can eat, um, or what they do when they do eat. So that gives me a lot of information. I'll always ask about their mood, about any suicidal thoughts, because we know that um, suicide risk, for example, in anorexia nervosa is 32 times that of someone who doesn't have anorexia. Um, ask about anxiety. I want to know about their life. So um, are they working? Are they studying? What, uh, are they in relationships? Have they told anyone about their eating disorder? Are they in the waiting room? Would they like to come in for part of the discussion? And then at, towards the end of the assessment, I'll explain to them um, what diagnosis the, their behaviours meet. I'll explain that it's very common, their condition. It's not their fault. And I'll do some diagrams to explain what I think has caused it. Um, a lot of it's about how starvation leads to binging or leads to obsessional thinking and leave them with a sense of hope, explain that there's some really good evidence-based treatments out there. The starved brain has behavioural, social, emotional and cognitive effects. The behavioural effects around food and eating include overwhelming preoccupation with food, ritualistic eating and loss of control of appetite for some people. The social and emotional effects include depression, mood swings, anxiety, withdrawal, isolation and decreased libido. The cognitive effects include impaired problem solving and decision making, poor concentration, alertness, comprehension and judgment, and rigid thought patterns. The longer the period of starvation, the more entrenched the behaviours and cognitions, and the more severe the medical complications become. I used to say a lot, it was like, the thing that's going to save me feels like it's going to kill me, and the thing that's killing me feels like it's going to save me. But there's something about um, that destructive form of keeping yourself safe that's really important. And taking that away from someone, um, it might be life-saving, but the support that you need to give that person is really huge. My biggest concern was the stigma that was going to be attached to me as a, um, you know, uh, as a 40 year old guy going to a doctor and going, I think I have an eating disorder. You see a, a lot of times where people with eating disorders, they know that they've got something wrong with them. And, and it is that, that double edged sword in their mind is, I don't necessarily want to let this go because it's serving as a function for me. It's something that's in their life that they're using for a particular purpose. So the best thing that I can do, that I can say to a doctor or a clinician is, is embrace what they're saying, acknowledge what they're saying and live in their shoes. So be there for them. And don't dismiss it. Don't put any of the stigma attached to it. Um, that, that may come across in, in social media or whatever the case may be. Um, just be there for them. I was very objected to seeking help. This was also at a time of the eating disorder where things were starting to feel good for me. Um, I was initially receiving what uh, someone with an eating disorder would say the peak experience of this. Um, so essentially when I was thrown into treatment, I was very objected. I had completely shut myself off from everybody. I didn't have any trust for professionals, for parents, for friends, um, because I believed that I was in control, that this was finally the way that life was going. And because I was functioning well, I had no idea why I was seeking help. Uh, you know, I, I've learned a lot from hearing people with lived experience talk about how difficult it is for them to, to present for help. They're terrified. I had one um, colleague who's, who speaks regularly um, to other clinicians and with a lived experience and as she explained I was up all night once worrying I was going to die because I was getting palpitations I'd, um, I'd been vomiting all night and I thought if I go to the emergency department they just there's a lot of other sick people there there's car accidents and when I go and they say hey you're fine there's nothing wrong with you but they haven't done any tests that's really discouraging so I think the first thing I would say to everyone who comes along for help is it's really good you've come to ask for help and I'm sure we'll be able to, to help you. So just to encourage them they've done the right thing. And also acknowledge that most people with eating disorders have mixed feelings. 
And it's almost like there's two parts. There's the healthy part of you that wants to have normal eating patterns, normal thoughts to be able to um, have good relationships. And the other part, which we call the eating sort of part, that all it cares about is numbers. And how many times have you done this? And, and what about this? And it's very self-critical. And, they're not. and so we want to get in alliance with that healthy part of you. Normally, I think a person would hopefully go to see their GP. For example, if they saw their GP, the GP would need to think about, or any clinician actually who sees them first, would need to think about, are they medically, how do we monitor their medical safety? Uh, how do we ensure they get the nutritional needs they need? And also, how can they get access to some evidence-based psychological treatment? So as a bare minimum, everybody needs that with an eating disorder. So um, a GP would be fine as long as they're aware of what needs to be monitored every week. Uh, I'd recommend they see a dietitian, especially a dietitian with experience in eating disorders, so they can get really good advice about uh, what to eat, how much of it, what types of food, because that's gonna help their brain get nourished again. And then a therapist who's trained in one of the evidence-based treatments, whether that be CBTE or SSCM or MANTRA, I'm mainly talking about adults because I mainly work with adults, but for children and adolescents that would be family-based treatment would be the, the treatment of first choice. I think the important thing is communication and consultation, and a case consultation is always a good idea if that can be done by phone or in person, where all the folks who are involved in the person's care get together and decide who's going to be doing what. And the important thing is, as I said, that they have medical monitoring, and so that could be done by a GP, but it could also be done by a psychiatrist or they might have a physician um, and they need nutritional support. That might be able to be done by a psychiatrist or a psychologist who specialise in eating disorders because CBTE does involve, and so does FBT, involves um, uh, looking at nutrition. And many dietitians have you know, good, um, great methods for engaging and supporting and, and, and have counselling skills as well. So it's, and of course the person with the illness decides in the end uh, who they feel they've got a therapeutic alliance and who they can work with but it's important that their medical, nutritional and psychological needs are met. Um, but regular case consultation, either by letter, telephone or face-to-face, -face, really helps uh, everybody, especially the patient. It's really important for us to be included in that, that whole discussion and the whole process and, and things because we're the ones going through it. Um, but we need to be guided through that, not to be told that this is what you're gonna do. Um, it's, well, here's some options um, here's how we can help you and here's, here's the group that are around you to support you know, what you're going through and making sure that I was included, making sure that I knew exactly what you know, was, was being done to me and why. Um, why is that important? But why am I thinking this way and, and things like that? So, you know, and, and every now and then giving the reins back to a few other people and going, I can't make these decisions right now. I'm not in a good headspace and it's important for me not to make these decisions. If the person's minimising it and I really think their life's at risk, I think that's a reasonable ethical reason to call their next of kin. Just like someone who's had a stroke or a brain injury uh, and their, their capacity's impaired or dementia or schizophrenia, I, you know, as long as I think that's a supportive relationship, I obviously have to weigh each situation up. Um, I minimised because I was terrified. Um, I minimised because I knew that she would actually do something about it in terms of like hospitalisation or um, that kind of critical care. I knew that if she thought I was in that spot, then she would call someone and that I wouldn't be able to just walk out of the office. And that terrified me because I needed my eating disorder. I needed to go home and have the same thing and do the same thing for the afternoon and create the same weird thing I was gonna eat for dinner and then go to bed at seven because I had no energy to do anything else. And the idea that that would be taken away from me was so terrifying. I, yeah, I minimized, I lied, I didn't tell her about feeling dizzy or calling in sick to work or I stopped being so honest with her. Um, but she's pretty smart, so she saw, saw what was going anyway and did what she needed to do. But I think that, um, that minimising, yeah, it's avoiding 
on the but then on the other hand too I think when you're that sick you in my head it was always I'm not sick enough um and I don't know what that I don't know what sick enough would look like because I would have died if I hadn't gone into hospital and I didn't see that at all. So eating disorders are mental illnesses uh, that deprive people of their capacity and uh, can cause um, death and serious medical complications. So in every, um, every I want to say, civilised jurisdiction in the West, we have a thing called the Mental Health Act. And the Mental Health Act is there in case you or I um, lose our capacity for whatever reason to make informed judgments. And we have the right in those situations to have a substitute decision maker until we get our, our right minds back. But the criteria, mental health acts differ, but the criteria for each of them is you need to have a mental illness that is um, impairing your capacity. Secondly, your, your life needs to be at risk. Uh, thirdly, uh, your capacity is impaired by that mental illness, your capacity to make decisions. And fourthly, that there's treatment available that could reverse that. And so, for example, with someone with anorexia nervosa who's medically at high risk, who doesn't want hospital, in fact, can't even bear the thought of any nutrition. Um, you know, if I had that, I would want someone to step in and say, uh, actually, your anorexia has hijacked your thinking. We're going to give you the nutrition you need till your brain gets, gets back and then you can recover. So for me, the mental health is doing what I would hope someone would do for me uh, if I lose my mind for whatever reason uh, or lose my... I guess the more technical term is lose my capacity to make informed judgments. Also, there have been some coroner's cases where um, the coroner's made it very clear that the mental health act should have been used where there's been some tragic outcome and they didn't use it. So the, the law courts are very clear um, and also, but the ethics and the, I think, and the ethical principles around the use of mental health act is very clear as well. So it's absolutely essential that the family are involved with both adolescent patients and with adults. The question is, what are some strategies that are useful for involving the family, especially where a person's minimising their eating disorder? And so I always ask every patient I see, uh, who's their loved one, who's their next of kin, do they know about the eating disorder, are they in the waiting room, uh, would you mind if we bring them in at some stage just to explain what our discussion is and what the treatment plan is? Most people are actually relieved and want to, um, in my experience. and. I often say it might just help your mum to be less anxious and to be giving you less of a hard time if she actually knows what's going on. And that's the way I would present it. And I always offer to phone them too or to meet with them in the next appointment. And if someone's got a good capacity and they definitely don't want their family involved, we respect that as well. Guided self-help uh, is a treatment that's been proven to be effective for people with bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder. And it's a, a mode of treatment uh, where the, it can sometimes be delivered by somebody who haven't necessarily had a lot of training in eating disorders, and it's also more cost effective uh, than, than your um, standard treatments like CBT or SSCM. So it often involves 10 to 12 treatments of the patient and the, uh, and the clinician reading a book together and going through the steps in that book. So it's, it's like bibliotherapy in a way, but um, with a clinician helping. And so uh, two books, for example, that can be used for guided self-help are Christopher Fairburn's Overcoming Binge Eating, but Peter Cooper has also written a book called Overcoming Binge Eating and Bulimia Nervosa. Both of these books have been shown in studies if a clinician works step-by-step step with the patient to do the exercises uh, to result in 50 to 60% of clients improving uh, so it's often a good first step for those conditions uh, because other treatments are often more time intensive, more expensive. Sometimes there's not practitioners around who can develop, who can deliver CBTE, for example. So a, a guided self-help is a fir good first step and a large number of patients get better with that. If you're a clinician who's not necessarily had a lot of training in eating disorders, you could access and read one of these books and with your client, um, week by week or month by month, go through a chapter of that book. It's, that's the way it's laid out. And you'll be looking at things like understanding what's causing the eating disorder, uh, trials of regular eating, looking at emotional triggers to, to eating disorder behaviours, looking at alternative strategies to deal with those triggers. And so it can be a useful way for you and the client together to uh, have an evidence-based approach to, to getting better using your 
your general uh, clinical skills? I think when people talk to you in a way that kind of communicates that they do understand, or that even if they don't understand, they care. Like they, um, like they see the pain or they see the conflict or I think the hardest thing is when like walking into a doctor's office and like, oh, you look well. It's like, oh, OK. OK, so I look well, which means I am well, which means that's what I need to say. Um, rather than asking, like, how are you? As soon as someone puts that judgment on it, it makes it really difficult to be honest about what's going on. So if they're an outpatient with an eating disorder, uh, medical monitoring is especially important if they're restricting their oral intake or if they're engaging in dangerous behaviours like, like purging, like vomiting, because um, they can lose potassium with the latter. And so the important thing is to every week with an outpatient, look for the things that could lead to their, just to put it bluntly, they could kill people quickly. Okay, so we're looking at postural heart rate and postural blood pressure. So if their postural blood pressure is dropping by more than 20 millimetres, that would be an indicator for admission. If their postural heart rate's jumping by more than 20 beats per minute, an indicator for admission. Also their absolute heart rate, so they've got what's called a bradycardia, if their heart rate's below 50 beats per minute, or if it's jumping very high, like more than 120 beats per minute or if their systolic blood pressure is below 90 millimetres. For an adult, for an adolescent, anything below 80 millimetres. So that should be checked every week. Uh, then the other things that can cause people to die quickly are, and they're all low things. So low glucose, low phosphate, low potassium, low magnesium. If any of those things are low and below the normal range, that's an indicator for admission to hospital. As part of that, you're also asking what they're eating and how many times they're purging. But they're, they're the, they're the, and those things don't take long to actually check. So if you're a clinician and you're not necessarily a, a specialist in eating disorders and you've, um, your patient's on a waiting list for many months, uh, what I would suggest you do is actually call the specialist eating disorder service in your state. There's one in nearly every state now. And that you, you speak to the consultation service for advice, ask some, um, people who are specialised in eating disorders, what you should be doing. For an inpatient, if someone's sick enough to need a medical admission, uh, we would normally recommend continuous nasogastric feeding uh, because they haven't been able to eat in hospital. And we've just published a study that shows that if you use continuous nasogastric feeding in a medical setting as opposed to oral feeding for the first week, it is, um, and I know there's similar work with adolescents, yeah, so there's a lower risk of rebound hypoglycemia where the blood sugar can drop and, and lower risk of refeeding syndrome where the potassium or phosphate and magnesium can drop. So for someone who's in hospital, as well as the nasogastric feeding, they need to have ECGs every day. They need to have blood tests, checking all those things every day. And we would recommend four times a day that we check their blood pressure and heart rate lying and standing and four times a day and at 2 a.m. they have a blood glucose measurement. We also put everyone in hospital on thiamine and multivitamin. The thiamine is to prevent a thing called Wernicke's encephalopathy, where your thiamine or vitamin B1 can drop and you can get brain damage. So when a person's really starved, there's a risk of underfeeding and there's a risk of overfeeding. So it has to be in a very controlled environment with all those things checked. These guidelines can be found in most state eating disorder service websites or also in the Royal College of Psychiatrists um, clinical practice guidelines. We've in our guidelines have actually put weight on the bottom of the list because a lot of clinicians focus too much on weight rather than the actual things the person's going to die from. No one's ever died from low weight ever in the history of uh, medicine, but they have died from low temperature, low blood pressure, low heart rate, low potassium, low phosphate, low magnesium, low glucose. They're the things I've got in my brain when I'm assessing someone's risk. This then started the round of hospital admissions for me where I guess I was very angry or the eating disorder was. It was very much in control and it became a very revolving door situation for me. So I had up to 25 admissions where I did not want to be there and it was the eating disorder basically taking over of playing the game that I had to, to go out to only find myself back in a matter of weeks or months later. Continuity of care is extremely important because it doesn't 
just start and stop the minute you leave the hospital. Just because you've been discharged from hospital, for example, or inpatient or outpatient, it doesn't mean that you're fixed and it doesn't mean that you're still medically okay. But what it does mean if you have continuous care is you still have the next lot of team or the next person or even the same people that you've already worked with just in a different format but they know you, they know what you've been doing. They know, you know, we've got all this information here about you. We can now start to, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll take that next step. Whereas if you go, we'll go and see someone else, you then have to start that whole process again. And starting that process again is so tiring and so draining and you just don't want to do it. So again, having that continual feed of, of people or groups and teams or whatnot to drag you through um, until you do get to a point where you go, no, oh, we're, we're all in a good spot here. You know, thank you to the people back there that, that did help me. You know, you, you saved my life. You then, then that gave you guys the ability to save my head. Um, and then, yeah, now I can live. Continuity of care is really important. And so this, uh, whether this is the person's GP or their psychologist or their dietitian, I think it's really important that that clinician not only keeps in touch with their, their client, but also with the other practitioners involved. And it's good to, to reach out if you've heard your patient's been admitted or is having some specialist program, to reach out to those clinicians and say, you know, I, I'm, I've known such and such for so long, and this is what she's found helpful, or he's found helpful, so to, to give as much information as possible. But that is really reassuring for the patient too as they, they um, traverse the different aspects of the health setting. I think I'm, I see the changes. I'm definitely more recovered now than I was, you know, three years ago or five years ago. Um, I think the thing I notice more now is the mental process. Um, like I'm physically more well than I've ever been, um, but the, the thought process and the, the kind of rituals and the rules and the, um, the way I see myself and the way I see food it, um, yeah, it's pretty constant. So definitions vary about what a severe and enduring eating disorder is, but one definition is someone who's had more than seven years of uh, symptoms and disability uh, despite treatment. So the first thing I look at, has there been a severe and enduring lack of service response? You know, is there, are there a lack of clinicians who know how to treat the condition? So before, um, I guess, labelling someone as having a severe and enduring eating disorder, I'd look at have they actually had access to evidence-based quality treatment. Now, if they have, and, and we know 20 to 30% of, um, of people will have a severe and enduring uh, course, uh, we're fortunate in that there's actually been some really good research into looking at what is effective in that group of patients. And what they found is that if the, um, the usual treatments like CBTE or SSEM are modified in the following ways, first of all, uh, remove the focus on weight in your treatment, look at what are some common goals. So look at what the person's goals are. So that might be that they want to get back to university, they might want to um, take up an activity or a hobby, they might have a better relationship with uh, a family member. So focus on those goals, they're the goals that we're going to, and agree on admissions only for medical rescue if they're in, and, and short admissions if they're imminently um, at risk. And seeing the person regularly though, weekly for an hour for up to 40 or 50 sessions. So the important thing with a person severe and enduring injury is always to have a sense of hope, but say we're gonna just shift the focus to something that's evidence-based um, and it's focusing on working on what the goals you want. Because all this focus on weight hasn't really helped you and it's caused you probably a lot of frustration. For myself, we tried many methods. So we tried Mandometer, we tried conventional medicine, um, we tried unconventional medicine, we tried many methods and I believe it was the combination of everything. I know at the time I was very stubborn or the eating disorder was of going nothing is working but it's hindsight now of looking back to the professionals. I had uh, doctors, I had dietitian, I had psychiatrists and at the time I felt uh, nothing was working but looking back now, it was little pieces or little things that were ingrained along the way that made the entire journey of recovery possible. How would a health professional know if they reach the limits of their expertise and what should they do? 
I think sometimes you provide the right treatment, whatever the health condition is, and the person uh, doesn't get better for whatever reason. I think that's always a flag to consult. And so um, consult a specialist eating disorder service, consult a colleague. Most of us have both individual supervision as professionals or peer supervision, um, or to involve another practitioner. So I think you should always consult but sometimes you've just got to hang in there with the person as well. You know, we can't always tell or decide when people are going to change, but we need to keep them safe and maintain that hope for them. And uh, often people uh, who are suffering really appreciate that, even though and they often feel frustrated they're not making the shift, but uh, hanging in there I think is very important. And sometimes if you feel like you're not making a difference, you are a lot of... Um, People I've asked what made the biggest difference to you in your recovery, and they said it was a clinician, even if they didn't know what they're doing that much, being kind and uh, non judgmental, they found that really uh, important in their recovery.